Okay, so I want to talk about architecture in Unity and C Sharp, and not just architecture, but in dialect, in QA choices, in structures of your scenes, your prefabs, your folders and files, um, as well as patterns and principles that you apply to your code. All of those types of things I want to discuss. Now, I'm going to be splitting these across all sorts of videos, but the first, uh, I'm going to call out right away that I don't trust Solid anymore for enterprise applications even. I don't think it solves problems, the problems that people are expecting it to solve. It creates some idealistic ways and I'll discuss some pieces of that, but I plan to go into more detail on that because I'm sure that that statement is going to arouse a lot of arguments immediately. Um, but I'll give, so I'll, I'll give my reasoning for it along the way. Okay, and that, that of course is with a huge statement that back in 2017, I was on stage at Unite presenting on how to use Solid and touting its super valuable nature inside of how you can use it in projects. Um, granted, if you don't have anything better, if you don't have a reason to use something else or, or why you're not going to, then keep using it. Um, don't make any decisions on architecture that you don't have a reason to do. All right. So what is the solution that I use instead now? I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how I solve the problem of growing architecture, of growing project sizes, and still keeping that code organized and maintainable and bug light. I want to say bug free, but that's, that's just a technical impossibility. Okay. So uh, let's see. Inside of here, I've got one, I've got this architectural digest. The architectural digest is a, a list of slides that list all the architectures inside of my code. So if I were to click on one, and first off, you'll notice that I have a lot of them. Sometimes they they call it architectural digest. Other times they say design choices, dialect, uh, Unity patterns. Um, but this is the key idea. So there was a project called Codevore, otherwise known as CS20, um, and another one called VTB, um, and there's the architectural digest for it. But let's dive into Codevore, into CS20. I list off patterns and principles and dialects and testing strategies and various things that define how our project is supposed to work. So I'm calling out those changes and what those systems are inside of here. Now, if a class doesn't actually interact with anything else, if it doesn't influence state anywhere else in your program, then whatever. I, I literally do not care about what it does in its code. If it is, if it gets slow or sluggish, if it introduces a bug, if it doesn't work right, it is isolated and usually that means it is also very easy to identify the culprit of it. The bugs that cause the real problems are the ones where architecture is involved, where you have one piece of a code calling code somewhere else in a project and changing state back and forth. So then now your bug happens over here even though the trigger of what's causing it is down here in an almost unrelated class, sometimes bounced around several pathways of other objects before it gets to the point where you realize a bug is happening. That is really difficult to backtrack in many cases of where that bug is really stemming from. And a huge amount of time gets wasted trying to figure those ones out. Your architectures need to be very solid. I'm using the keyword solid here, even though I'm saying I don't follow it. I don't follow the solid principles. There are pieces and elements of it I pull in, but um, let me give you one example. Uh, single responsibility. Single responsibility is great. It is a system that basically says that inside of your code, if you have a class, it should have effectively one reason for failing, one reason for a bug, uh, one reason for change really. So that if something happens, you can identify where this class is, what its exact purpose is, and you won't necessarily, you won't have to do things to it that change the structure of the architecture. Now, this is idealistic. It's not realistic in most projects because we only understand its single responsibility, its purpose, 
in the state of the code as it exists today, in its purpose as it exists today. When we get that new feature in, there are feature requests that get in, and this happens almost invariably in every project where we start to change the direction. We add a new feature that suddenly needs to have new hooks or ways of identifying things or something. And it means that now what we defined, well, we put a perfect single responsibility case and split up our class perfectly before, no longer makes sense anymore. We cannot guarantee single responsibility will be static, that it's going to stay that way. Same thing with our code, with our architectures in general. Every time we insert an architecture, there's always a reason that something in it can fail. There, I, I like observables a lot. I use them because they, they're very flexible, they're nice, they work with designers well to help influence and change all sorts of things and allow freedom of change. But that doesn't mean I'm going to pull it into every project. Some don't just don't work as well. Okay, so here's how this works. Inside of this list, I have, let's say I'm using Service Locator or I'm using Observables. And if you're not familiar with them, please check them out. I'm not going to cover them in this one, but I plan to cover them in future uh, talks on this playlist on the different architectures, patterns, and principles, and how I apply them. Um, so Service Locator and Observables are ones that I commonly use, even though Service Locator I, I don't stick to as much anymore. Dependency Injection I never use anymore. Um, and I'll cover reasons why later again uh, in future videos. Okay, so I express the challenge. What is the challenge that we're trying to solve? What is the general solution? What is our general answer to it? And how do we do it? What are the specifics inside of our project right now? So when we're seeing this, this tells me observables. Okay, if you're familiar with the observable pattern, or if you're not familiar, a very brief overview is that, do you ever have an if statement you put at the top of your update command that checks a variable state? And if it's not in a particular condition, you exit out of the update right away because there's nothing to update. Well, that update is still being called every single frame over and over and over again. And if this is something that only happens a couple times, that is a painful way to deal with stuff. And granted, there are other ways to deal with this than observables, but an observable basically allows you to take a variable that you name in a class or something that can just kind of float around and it's uh, inside of your code, and then you can just access it. Uh, you, you have reference to this variable, but then if it changes, if it actually changes, it compares its new value to its old one, and then it'll trigger a listener event. So you can listen for it. You tie in a command, and when that changes, it will call a method on your code. Great, now I don't need an update function because I know my code will learn the instant that it changes. That's great. That lets us solve all sorts of problems. Um, and in, increase performance and make it easier so we don't have to have things that are just wastefully checking things over and over again. Okay, so uh, we have on this project, we have these calls for it. Now, let's say that something happened in our code. So we got this new feature in and it changes the fact that we, that we need observables or the system of how we use observables. Now, this new feature requires that we split up our data, that we have larger data sets being passed around or something. I don't know what it might be, but we take an existing architecture and it just doesn't fit anymore. Well, here's the big thing. If if you get a feature that comes to your desk as a developer and you are starting to work on design and figure out how you're going to implement it and it doesn't fit into an existing uh, into an existing uh, architectural pattern that you have listed in this document, that is a red flag. It doesn't mean don't do it. It means raise the alarm, let other developers on your team know, especially leads um, or people higher up in the tech in the tech chain of tech command. Um, let them know about it, that the solution to this particular case looks like it has to be either a whole new architecture being added in, a new slide just being in inserted, and that will solve the problem. Or the worst case is that it has to alter existing ones. 
altering existing ones means we already have other code that could be massive that depends on this architecture operating in this way. So if it requires a change, that's the scary one. That's the tough one. Um, but that's the discussion. We raise the discussion and figure out, is this something we actually need? Can we do, solve this in a different way? Can we use a different thing for our observe for our uh, inventory in our game or whatever? The, I, I don't know. I don't want to try pulling in too many specifics here. But we question those. And now, because of the fact we have this map of architectures, that means that when we identify that something does need to change, we can go through each one of the architectures, each one of these patterns and principles and styles and dialects that we're putting into our code, and we can effectively question it. Is this going to change anything here? No. Okay. Is this going to change anything in here? Yes. Okay. Write a new slide of what that's supposed to turn into and indicate that that's supposed to replace this one. Um, and that it's up for discussion, but that's effectively what you're going to throw out there to the rest of the team. Like, this is what I'm proposing that we change out observables so that it does this or that it changes this. Now that tells us what are the things we need to change? This is where our tech debt comes from. Tech debt, places are way too lenient on tech debt, on the allowance of tech debt inside of the projects. And I strongly believe that is because there's not a strong enough organization, uh, organizational pattern to identify it clearly. We understand that there are expenses that come in with changing the way that some of our existing architecture works. So we literally call it out as tech debt that once we get our release out the door, then we're going to come back and spend some time resolving it. We're going to wait a few weeks or a few months to go ahead and resolve this problem that we best understood at the moment that we were making it. What this system does is really help you identify what is going to be the cost? What are the fields, the commands that need to change? What is that? What needs to change in our code where we can literally just say, OK, well, we're going to be changing static dot get um, and we need to implement uh, an alternative solution. Let's go into our code and do a search for the static dot get and see how many things are using it. Where is it being used? And we can just literally call it out. Okay, it's being used in 420 places. This is a rather large change, but every single one of them is a very simple call. And there's only two places where we need to implement this alteration that's happening or 20 places or something like that. Having that list called out makes it really easy to identify the expense of what changes you need to put in. And now when you're saying how much is going to be to put this new feature into play, it's not we can get this feature into play and then have technical debt a few months down the road. It is this is the cost of it. Granted, we, we might be we're, it's an estimate. All of these are estimates on time, but we believe it'll take 24 developer hours to get this get these changes in. Um, if we split it into technical debt, uh, we are introducing all sorts of potential bugs. Uh, and especially a very likely thing is that we will lose track of all sorts of technical debt in our projects where we'll have pieces and fragments of different types of architectures all over the place. So when you're over here working in this code, it does this. When you're in this part of this class and it calls an event, it calls this system. When you're in this part of the same class and it needs to trigger an event, it's using this other event system. These are realistic things that happen in the real world to very successful code bases that are at the same time a nightmare to manage. This is why tasks grow significantly more challenging because there are so many more variables in play that are hard to identify. And we just learn that about projects that these variables are tough. It's hard to identify. So we're going to pad our estimates with an extra 50%, 200%, 1000% just because we know that area is complicated. That we know that we will likely run into challenges trying to implement change there. That is what this does. Now, it does another great thing that if a new developer comes onto the project that you can just say, 
hey, what's our, take a look at these architectures. Every way that our code has for interacting with other pieces of code is listed here. If you're implementing a solution, make sure it fits within this. And if it doesn't, rate, let us know. And we'll discuss what, how to either change the problem or change the architecture. And, but let it be a team discussion so everyone knows about it, that everyone's aware, even if it's just yourself on a project. If you have a project that you want to last, you need to have a system in place to allow the architecture to remain easy to work with, to help prevent it from hiding bugs. And remnants of old architectures are exactly the type of thing that will give it plenty of bug space to feed on, whatever you want to call it. Now, anyway, I've introduced this. Um, this is what I do. Um, there are a thousand right ways to do this stuff. There are thousands of wrong ways to do this stuff. I'd love to hear your opinion on how do you solve this general problem. And I would expect to hear solid is going to be the answer for some of them. Or you use a different pattern as your principle. Um, or a different thing that you use wikis. Uh, and you, you identify all these different stuff in clear documentation. I've, I agree the documentation is necessary. But I think of this as uh, XML comments in code. I used to believe XML comments belonged everywhere, but I found it to be overkill because there were so many places where the command is literally uh, something like reverse the direction. And then the, su the summary that goes in in the XML, uh, the XML comments is this reverses the direction. You just put spaces in there and you basically say exactly what that method name is saying, what exactly that property is saying, or what exactly that class is written out as already is named to begin with. And so there are so many places that we do that that I just don't see it as valuable unless there's something about it that is awkward. And if you feel like you need an XML comment, that's actually a pretty good sign that you're doing something a little too complicated and there might be a better solution. Not always. Sometimes you really need to explain that extra complication. Anyway, um, so that is how I tend to solve the nature of expanding architectures. Now I'm going to go into more details. There's a lot of other stuff I'm going to cover in future videos. I'd love to hear your feedback. What do you think of this? Do you think this is something that could work for you in your projects? I'm going to say this right off the bat, that if it is an existing project, a brownfield project, something where there's been like uh, several years of development from a dozen or so developers, uh, that you're you're in a minefield. It's not reasonable to be able to list out all of these architectures because it almost invariably will have hundreds, if not thousands of different patterns and methods of allowing the communication structure to work. And that that's tough. That is just a big red flag that you're going to be, oh, everyone's going to be aware this is a tough code base to solve. And a lot of developers will want a new version. Now, you got to understand that from the business perspective, great, yeah, we'll, we'll let you go spend, uh, you know, $150 an hour for eight developers for six months to go recreate this. And if you're talking about $150 an hour and it's like most developers not making that, think about what it actually costs a company because it's not just your paycheck, it's the expenses of running a building, of paying for a portion of your insurance, your benefits package, your insurance packages. Some people, companies even have insurance packages on their lead developers uh, so that and designers so that if somebody dies or quits or has some other accident, that the, comp the insurance company will actually pay out money to help solve things faster so that they can have a sign-on bonus to get someone in there quickly to replace this core necessity that that person, that that skill resource was providing. There's a lot of expense <laughs> that people don't know about in relations to what it costs to run a development company. Okay, so what's your thoughts on this? What other types of patterns would you like to hear about? I'm planning, I've got a lot that I'm going to be going into and discussing, but I'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks.